Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to the auction of the Kennedy Space Center <laughs> assets. Um, we'll be starting with vehicular assembly building, and then we'll be moving on to the launch pads. Um, <laughs> so I'll keep my, my introduction short. Uh, my name is Chris Tabona. I look after open source for Google, um, as much as anyone does. And um, I also try to help out with the NASA relationship. Uh, so sometimes, about once a month it's looking like, we have over folks from NASA uh, and we try to introduce them and say, hey, you know, a month from now, maybe we'll have another person, maybe three weeks, maybe five weeks. But if you're interested in space and, and, and this country's activities therein, as well as the nation, the world's activities therein, um, just keep an eye on uh, the space <laughs> alias. Uh, and I try to get the word out. So uh, look in, in the talks at Google. Uh, you do this as well, right? So, you know, we have a lot of folks who are... There's a lot of, if you're, if you're a space enthusiast, this is a good place to work as long and short of it. Uh, today we have Ross Beyer. Beyer? Beyer? Beyer. 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 That's what I thought. And um, who works at the Carl Sagan Center uh, of the SETI Institute. But he also does really exciting things for the Intelligent Robotics Group. And he's going to go over some stuff today. Uh, include, you know, he's also, uh, it's worth pointing out, he ruined, not ruined, made his vacation awesomer. <laughs> by uh, planning out uh, some, uh, while well, we were all relaxing and skiing and drinking eggnog, he was planning uh, photography for the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, among other things, uh, in the High Rise project, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, he's more productive than any of you, and um, I hope you'll welcome him to Google. So. Thank you, Chris. I will turn this microphone off so I don't get any interference. So I'm going to talk to you today about maps. Uh, and uh, although that may seem like a facetious thing to talk about to a Google audience, maybe some people here aren't from Geo. Um, but what we're going to talk about is not just maps. When we talk about maps, a lot of people just think of them as utilitarian things. Things like this that just show you information. People have an atlas. They get that information. It's utilitarian for them. Um, some of the maps that, of course, that you create uh, certainly, Google Maps allow for people to do some analysis with the information presented to them in the map, right? So they can say, I'm here and I want to go there, and, and the tool will provide them a couple of different routes, and so they can decide, right? It gives them the ability to choose by, by picking amongst those options. Um, so utilitarian maps totally have their place, but there are other kinds of maps, ways that we can put the data together in a way that help people, either scientists or engineers, really step forward and make, you know, really learn things or, or do analysis either to land spacecraft on other planets or to explore those other planets or to learn more about them. Other kinds of maps are, are more interesting. Here's a map you may have seen uh, put together by uh, uh, Mark Newman of counties in the 2012 election. This is how they voted. There's not just red and blue, but also purple in between. And this is really cool. If you want to know where you are, you can see how that county voted. Um, and, and it's interesting for, for that, but it doesn't really tell you other things, right? Because your eye does a very good job of doing kind of an area-based matching and saying, well, shouldn't that all be blue or at least mostly purple if the president that we have actually won? Um, but that's, of course, because there aren't the same number of people in every county. So if you change that to this map, which is where all of the counties are modified by the number of voters within them, you can see the Bay Area. You can almost see Treasure Island. You can certainly see LA County. <laughs> Manhattan becomes gigantic. Um, and, and uh, you know, Chicago as well. And so this is another way of presenting that information. Not in the, you know, you wouldn't want to plan your route to your vacation with this map. But this map, information displayed in this way, really helps you learn something about, about this data uh, in a way that the other map maybe doesn't. Um, there are other kinds of maps that we make too that aren't necessarily geographical in nature. You've seen perhaps maps like this, you know, maps of the internet or maps of this sci fi TV show. This is a map of physics. Um, which is fun. My favorite is astronomy here. In parentheses, you may not be able to see it says early physics, which is fun. Um, and this isn't something that we do kind of in, in the modern day. You've seen maybe a lot of these. This was done in the 1930s. So um, geeks and maps uh, that are not necessarily about places have been around for a long time. Um, but as we step off into the solar system and we try and decide what kind of maps do we need to make to help scientists, um, you know, learn things about plants, either how they were formed or things about their environment so that we can land safely and operate there. We have to think about what kind of data we can acquire and what kind of, once we get that data, how we put it all together. So I'm, before we step off to the planets, I'm going to talk a little bit about this scene on the Earth. So this is a, a view of the Grand Canyon. This is not typical of how we have planetary data. 
uh, because this data was probably taken from uh, a rim based on its kind of view. But it shows you some things that I'm, I want to talk about here for a few minutes. When we go to a new planet, we don't have the uh, luxury of being able to scurry around on it. The first thing we send are our orbital probes, uh, and sometimes we get lucky and send, send rovers or landers. But perhaps you know, any good geologist could take a photograph and start telling you the story of probably approximately what happened here in a geologic sense. Right? They can probably tell you something about how these layers were built up in a constructional sense over the millennia, and also how the erosional processes then cut this river through, through these layers. But there's a point at which a geologist, just from looking at that picture, will stop because they will have to say, well, we have to start measuring this. I, can't, I, can, tell you a, I can spin you a good story, but we can't really go for it and do hypothesis testing and, and really kind of understand what happened here until we can measure it. Okay, and map it, they will say. And so, you know, certainly 100 years ago, the solution was to send people down and, and measure things. Um, the modern solution may even still be that. You might say, well, you know, we could have uh, aerial surveys or maybe a satellite that we can send over, but it may still even be cheaper to hire a couple of grad students with GPS units to scurry around these slopes and take measurements and actually take a photograph of this contact right here and say, what is different between the rock here and there, and how does that inform what happened in a geologic sense in this place. Now the other thing you might want to do, again, if you can't do that, because of course we really can't do that on other planets right now. We only sent six guys to the nearest globe you know, 40 years ago, and we haven't really done that since, which is too bad. Um, <clears throat> we have sent a lot of robots, of course. But what you want to do when you get those first photographs of another planet, and you see something like this, you want to say, well, how big is it? How deep is it? What is its shape? What can we use that information for to um, to, to advance our knowledge of what we're looking at and why it got that way. So when we go forward into the solar system, uh, overhead photographs are great. They're important. They're the essential first step. But we also need to know something about the depth that really, really helps us out, to give us a 3D sense of the place. And so one of the tools that we have at, at, at Ames is, is this tool that we've developed. This is my kind of ad slide with the URL on it. Uh, is the Ames Stereo Pipeline. This is a piece of software that we've developed over the years. Uh, it's Apache 2 licensed. Um, it used to be NOSA. It was terrible, and we got it changed. Um, so uh, this tool takes data, stereo photographs, and creates depth maps or, or train models out of it. Ten years ago, it started as, um, as software on our robots. We had a little robot camera, and we wanted to build terrain models. That's what this first model on the left is. It's a couple of fake rocks put in front of our, our, our rover. Uh, and you can see that we're accurately detecting that this rock is, is closer to us than the one behind it. Over the years, it's evolved so that we could take data from orbital satellites. Um, this one is of the moon. Um, and also, I'll talk later at the end of this talk about how we can apply this data to terrestrial, how we can apply this, these algorithms and this software to terrestrial data uh, uh, as well. Because the Earth's a planet too, as people always tell me. Um, but first, let's talk about the moon. So um, what if you want to land on the moon? Uh, you need to know something about its shape, because if you want to land something very precisely ver near something very dangerous, uh, you want to be careful about what's there and where it is. Uh, and this, this perhaps uh, busy slide talks about how you would want to precisely land something um, in rough terrain. We landed these rovers on Mars in big, fat parking lots, for the most part. Now, that's not to diminish their danger. They were certainly challenging in their own ways. But for the most part, we targeted big, flat areas where there wasn't very much topography. If we want to go to some place really interesting, like here, we can't just close our eyes and hope for the best. We need to know a lot more about the terrain. And we have to have smart systems on those spacecraft so that they can compare a map, perhaps, that we made ahead of time to what they're seeing out of their LIDAR eyes and out of their visual cameras. So they can match that up and say, Oh, maybe I'm up here, I'm on the top, and, but there's a canyon ahead of me. I have to prepare for that, right? So that's what this is about. It, it has different kind of, of, of uh, algorithms that happen. But as you get closer and closer to your target, if you want to land very precisely close to something, you have to be very smart about not only the map that you preload into the spacecraft so that it has a sense of where it is, but also uh, as those algorithms work, what they're looking for. So, um, to do those things, uh, we have to talk about what data we have for the moon, for example. Um, and one of the, the, the kinds of data we have are laser altimeter data. Um, from the uh, LRO spacecraft that's in orbit right now, there's something called this lunar orbital laser altimeter. And as it flies on its north to south orbit, it puts down this stitching of laser shots. Very highly accurate to within a centimeter. Great data, but sparse. 
Um, if you zoom all the way out, uh, as we've gone around the moon over the last four or five years, we've, we've gotten this very you know, good coverage. But even at the equator, there are kilometers between these kind of individual stripes. But this is an essential piece for, for building kind of a framework of the moon uh, in its shape. The next piece that we have are, are very high resolution imagery uh, that we get from the LRO camera. Here are some examples of it seen at 50 centimeters and, and a meter per pixel. Great images of the moon. You can see individual house and car sized boulders. Um, you can see uh, artifacts on the surface of the moon, right? That's the Apollo 15 landing site. And we can take that data with the stereo pipeline and build terrain models like this, this scene in the middle. Uh, and you can see that we're, we're resolving some of those big boulders in the terrain model that we build. Uh, and those are great high resolution, dense um, kind of terrain maps that we have, that we can have for that final bit. But somewhere in between kind of the global but sparse data and the very local and high res but dense data, um, we need something else to kind of bridge the gap for kind of landing site simulation and, and for spacecraft. And so I'm going to talk about a project that we worked on a couple of years ago that actually used data from the Apollo command modules. So uh, as you know, every time we sent people to the moon, we sent three people. Two guys went down, one guy stayed up in that thing. And on the command module was uh, a suite of cameras and instruments. Excuse me, one of them uh, is the, something called the Apollo metric camera. And uh, what it did is the, as this command module made uh, orbits around the equator of the moon, it just kind of took these rapid fire photos. And this is an example of them. And they had 75% overlap, so great stereo overlap taken within you know, a short period of time of one another. Uh, and they allowed us to build a great terrain data set uh, at you know, 10 to 40 meters per pixel. Uh, one of the challenges uh, was that the data taken by the Apollo metric camera were on film that was then returned to Earth and lived in a vault at JSC for about 40 years. And a couple years ago, it was pulled out and scanned with a very high resolution scanner. Uh, but there were certainly blemishes. The scanner got down to the photo grain. I don't know if you can see that here or not, but it certainly did. Uh, but it also, we could also see lots of interesting dust that we weren't sure if it was on the bed of the scanner or part of the original negative development. Um, so we had issues that we had to work around with film, different kinds of problems than we do with, with CCD data that we work with now. So that was fun. But ultimately what it allowed us to do is to build this map of the moon, um, which covers this kind of belt around the equator of the moon, at this very dense um, kind of 40 meter per pixel uh, posting. Um, and, and over a wide region to kind of fill the gap between the very high resolution terrain and the very sparse laser altimetry. And what it allows us to do is, is to do things like this, which is to create that terrain, put the image down on top of it, and provide you a view of the Apollo 15 landing site at Hadley Rill um, that no spacecraft ever took. Right? But one of the problems with images like this is that it's not actually uh, a dynamic thing. right? So this image as you see it is, is the photograph is actually placed down on top of the topography. We can't arbitrarily change the sun or change the day. Um, and that's maybe not so important at the equator, but a lot of the things that NASA is talking about doing on the moon are at the poles. And at the poles, the lighting really changes uh, from, from day to day depending on when you're going to run your mission. And so if your goal is to build a map that is lit the same way that your robot is going to encounter it when it comes down to land, you want to be able to you know, control the scene and move the sun around and, and modify those um, lighting conditions. And you can't do that with just this. Now, you can. This Having a terrain model is an important first step, but it's not the only step. So now I'm going to talk about albedo, but first I'm going to diverge and talk about Jane. Um, so one of the things that I want to ask you is, uh, in my, my attempt to talk about albedo, is what color is Jane's shirt? Is it black? Is it purple? Maybe it's a mauve. Hard to tell, really. Um, but if your goal is from this photograph of Jane to determine what the RGB triplet, if you will, of the color of his shirt is, you've got a lot of work to do from this one photograph, right? So what are the things that you might need to do? Well, you need a very complete understanding of all the wrinkles in his shirt. You would need to know where the camera was in space relative to your very high definition model of his shirt. You need to know where the light is coming from, okay? If you had all of those things, you could do the math, right? and find out what the color of his shirt was, or possibly his hat. And maybe you would discover that his hat is actually two-toned. It's orange on the bottom and yellow on the top. But it's hard to see because it's kind of washed out from the light. 
This is kind of the inverse problem that game developers have, right? When they have a video game, they already know where the stuff is, and they light it, and they show it to you. This is the inverse problem. It's you see the scene, maybe you know where everything is, and you want to try and find out what the shape of that thing is and, and what the inherent properties of the shirt, in this case, are. Um, the other thing that you need, of course, is not just the color of his shirt, because if you did that, and then maybe you simulated that in your little video game model that we were talking about, you would get a very plasticky looking shirt and a very plasticky looking hat. Okay. So in addition to just kind of the, the raw color of the thing, the other thing that you need is a good mathematical model for how light interacts with the thing, right? Which is why even if his shirt and his hat were the same color thing, they would look different because his hat is kind of fuzzy wool and the shirt is something else. Um, video game designers skip this and use textures, right, to, to kind of fake that. Uh, but people like Pixar and ILM that do high quality kind of digital movies, they have that down really well. They have the equations that describe how light interacts with their various surfaces. And so that's what we're trying to do on the moon. And the way that we do that, of course, is by knowing where our spacecraft was, knowing where the sun was, understanding that terrain, right, that was the step that I just showed you, um, and we can back out what the actual albedo or, or inherent brightness of the surface is. So what we would do is we would take images that look like this on the left, which is an actual scene, and you can see the scene go down the middle, and convert it into this image on the right, which is kind of a, if you will, a flattened view. Not perfect. Nothing is perfect. Um, but an idea of, you know, if you could take a shovel full from any one of these pixels and take it back to your lab and measure it, this is what its brightness would be. Okay. This, along with kind of that model of how light interacts with the surface, allows you to go back and light your scene any way you want and have a pretty good feeling that when your spacecraft comes and compares what it's actually seeing out of its camera with the map that you've preloaded and lit for the right way, that they'll be able to tell the difference between a giant pit that will kill it and just a shadow that's in the right place. Okay. Um, and that's a, uh, an engineering example, but also, you know, you can look at this from a scientific perspective and say, are these places, are those really brighter? Is there a different material there? Um, you know, and you can go back and use that to follow up with spectrometers and, and, and other kinds of, of, uh, of data. So that's the kind of work we do with albedo and the moon. So now I'm going to jump uh, to Mars. <coughs> um, and I love Mars. As, as uh, Chris just indicated, I was working on Mars over the winter break. Um, and these are examples of terrain models made with the high-rise camera. Um, the high-rise camera takes beautiful uh, 50 centimeter per pixel images or 25 centimeter per pixel images of Mars. We can take stereo images. These are all terrain models that we've built in their kind of false color, uh, color map glory. Um, uh, you can do fantastic science with these. You can learn things about polar deposits and craters and, and layers. Um, I could spend a whole hour talking about every one of these little subframes, uh, and I uh, put them all up here so that I would only spend one slide on it. Um, but understanding 3D is, is great and uh, uh, very useful for scientists, but I, I can't spend any time on it because there are other things to talk about. So one of the other things that we do, um, actually in conjunction with, with some of you guys, are, are mappy things. Um, and, and we help the community, the science community, use them in, in hopefully smart ways. So this. Uh, is the uh, high-rise, that, that image camera that I just talked about that's orbiting Mars right now. We have a way you can visit this website, and you can sign up, and you can say, I want a picture right there where the blue dot is. Take me a picture right there. And this is why, and you have to say your science rationale, and you can give us notes. Um, but the way that we enable people to do that is by showing them a Google Maps, right? This is a, a Maps API with the Mars map loaded in. We have uh, the red dots are where we've already taken photos, the white uh, areas where other people have suggested places to us, right? And this is a, a mechanism for people to talk to us via this map, if you will, and show us where they want to take data and why it's important, okay? And then, after we gather this information into our database and we do a science planning cycle, we go into a more complicated tool like this one that some people in the audience used to work on uh, before they came to Google. Uh, and it loads up, again, on a map. Uh, information of where we're going to take an image. And it shows us um, when we're doing a spacecraft planning cycle, it shows us uh, our observation is that Christmas colored little spot in there. Other instruments have these other uh, yellow uh, outlined boxes. That's where they're going to take data. Uh, this is the zoomed in view. There's a kind of a more larger view. This is tilted on its side. North is that way because 
that allows this to not just be a spatial map, but also a map in time. Our spacecraft flies from South Pole to North Pole on the day side. And so these are uh, other things about what the spacecraft is doing, what its roll angle is, other things. Uh, and so this is uh, a time-based plot, but it, it syncs up with this as well. So that's kind of a neat thing to marry space and time uh, in this graph. Super useful. We use it day in and day out to plan uh, observations on Mars. Um, the other thing that we've done is, is uh, working with Google to provide more of NASA's data to the public. We take a ton of data of great places in the solar system, but uh, kind of aside from the astronomy picture of the day and other kind of enthusiast sites, not many people can really see all of that data or explore it in a really good way. Um, and so we are very fortunate to be uh, working with, with elements of the GEO team to build Mars mode in Google Earth and, and moon mode in Google Earth and get not just maps, but also the things that go along with the maps. Um, videos from the Apollo landers, uh, waypoints, um, all kinds of information for the rovers, for the Apollo missions, everything. It's great. We're really happy about it. Uh, and it's super fun. And the great thing about this is that the idea was to provide this maps interface for the public, right? Our, our target audience was the public. Um, you know, the, the overriding thing in our discussion, our end user was grandma. Can grandma use this interface? But the other thing that I wanted to make sure that we did was also to provide something that was useful for scientists as well. Even though that wasn't the primary target, right? Scientists, this isn't, as you well know, Google Earth is not a GIS, but it comes really close in a lot of cool ways. And so our ability to put things in and make sure that when we show data that you could also drill down and find the raw information so that a scientist could say, oh, I'm interested in, you know, where the rover was on its track right here. You can bring up a rover, the waypoints for each of the rovers, and you can bring them up and you can go off to the other NASA sites that have the raw data for the rover at that place in time. Okay. Um, and so uh, it was very handy for us. It was good, it was reassuring for me as a scientist to be able to build that into a tool that I might also be able to use. In addition to just kind of putting content on, the other thing, you know, I showed you those kind of wireframe boxes before of where things were, right? Location is important. It's an essential first step. But the other thing you might want to do is actually take all of those images and put them on the globe so that someone can actually paw through them, much like they do in Google Map Earth or, or in Maps, and really look at what the data is. And so some of the projects that we've been involved in have been making these big planetary-wide mosaics, but again, sparse mosaics. So these, uh, on the left, we worked with Microsoft in their Worldwide Telescope project um, to put all the high-rise uh, images, right, 25 centimeters per pixel. This doesn't do it justice because you could zoom all the way into these things uh, in Worldwide Telescope. Uh, we also just this year did the same thing. There's a, a medium resolution imager that's only, you know, three to six meters per pixel called Context, CTX, on Mars. And that also has kind of a sparse mosaic that we put into Google, uh, into Mars mode for, for Google Earth. Um, and these provide another step for people to explore Mars at a very high resolution, not just average people, but also scientists. Okay. Um, also with Google Earth, one of the things that we, I talked about is, is um, I wanted to make it useful for scientists. And, and one of the greatest things about building a tool or working with something is when someone uses it in a way that you didn't expect, and it's a cool result. Um, and so one of the things that we learned uh, was happening is that people who drove the MER spacecraft, right? You may have forgotten it. It landed in 2004. Some of, uh, one of them is dead. This is Spirit. That's where it is right now. Uh, we lost contact with it. But Opportunity is still kicking almost 10 years after it got there. Um, and so, you know, after the, the initial flash of the spacecraft landing and the, you know, all the guys in coordinated shirts at JPL jumping up and being happy, um, you know, operations for that spacecraft don't just happen at, at JPL. After, t over time, the scientists who uh, plan and operate those spacecraft, they go back home to their families and their friends. And so the planning process of where to drive one of these rovers is like this geographically distributed process of different science, members of the science team taking different shifts at different times and saying, all right, who, where are we going to send this rover? Right? The scientists assemble a plan and then ship it essentially, send it to JPL. And the guys at JPL actually drive the rover and plan out that, you know, drive a meter this way, turn right, drive a meter that way. But it comes from the scientists. And one of the things that they, had a, they learned they had a problem with doing is kind of workshopping where they wanted this rover to go in the next day or the next two days when they were doing this planning. And what they ended up doing is they ended up using, after we had made Google Earth, 
uh, after we made Mars mode in Google Earth, they started using it for that because it was a great way for somebody you know, on their laptop or in their office machine to pull up Google Earth, flip it onto Mars mode, and use the authoring tools to say, I want the rover to go here. And they could use the polygon tool and draw a line. And then they could send that small KML file to their colleague, you know, two states away. And they could talk about it. And they could, you know, use the shared map abilities of Google Earth to plan out what was good and what was bad. Um, you know, I don't really need to tell you and be evangelical about the values of a shared digital map. But for these guys, it was a new experience for them. They didn't have this for their planet before. Now, that's not to say that Google Earth was the, you know, the ultimate planning tool, but it allowed the scientists to kind of say, well, let's go this way and that way and annotate things and discuss things before they said, all right, we have agreed that this is what we want you to do. And then you know, they can send that information to JPL, and JPL kind of executes it. So that was a cool way that uh, people used uh, Mars mode that I did not expect. Um, we have other challenges uh, in the solar system beyond kind of the moon and Mars. A lot of them like, I'm not going to talk about, but uh, small bodies. Um, small asteroids, things that are not triaxial ellipsoids. Uh, you know, how do you define latitude and longitude on something that's shaped like a peanut? Um, how do you even conceive of, of, of coordinates and map projections? And, and then how would you deal with those things in software? Um, these are challenges that are ahead of us, actually, still for NASA. Um, even though we have explored some of these places, we haven't kind of done it enough times to standardize on something. Um, and so um, there are still lots of challenges in, in mapping uh, in the solar system. Um, but I'm going to come back to the Earth and talk about how we've uh, adapted some of this stuff to terrestrial work. So again, kind of the underlying theme is, is, is three-dimensionality. And I'm going to kind of show you some examples of maybe train products that you're familiar with and how it compares to what, what we've been able to do. So this first one on the left is a SRTM DM at 31 meters per pixel. Oh, uh, let me give you the background. So this is a, a, a quarry uh, south of the San Luis uh, Reservoir where we've done some rover tests. Um, and one of the things we wanted to do is to actually have a DEM of our area, much like if we went to Mars, we'd have a DEM of the, of the area first, and then you would land your rover and you would drive your rover around in the area, right? So we wanted to have the same thing. We wanted to have a DEM of our, of our, of our kind of test site, and then we would drive our rover around inside of it and compare, and that would be fun. Um, and so the, the SRTM data here at 31 meters per pixel, I don't know if you can tell or not, you can't even really tell that there's a quarry here. This just looks like a nice mountain. Um, the next one over is uh, the USGS NED DEM at 9 meters per pixel. Here you can begin to see that there are some terraces here where the, the mountainside has been quarried. Um, and this train model that we built from our tools from the uh, Worldview 1 data is at half a meter per pixel. And that's the big scene that you see up above. And you can see the terraces um, and, and locate yourself very well. Um, and uh, we can compare that great against uh, the rover that we had that also was doing, it had a, a LiDAR, a Velodyne system for kind of uh, pinging its terrain, and also stereo cameras. So it allowed us to really compare between the two, the two models, just like you would um, on an actual space mission when you'd actually do that. Um, but we're not talking about actual space missions, we're talking about the Earth. And the reason why we had the ability to, to change this to work with terrestrial data uh, is because of a need that came from uh, Arctic researchers, of all folks. So it turns out the people who study ice in the Arctic uh, used to have a satellite of all things called ICESat. And it had a LIDAR on it. And it took data of the ice pack in the Arctic regions. Great. Important for monitoring ice. Because of course that stuff changes. You want to, lots of repeat coverage. But at one point, ICESat, of course, died. Uh, and it will still be a few more years before the replacement for ICESat, which will probably be called ICESat 2, will be launched. And in this time, there's no good terrain data of the ice at the poles. One of the things that Arctic researchers kind of found out is that the private companies, Worldview, Digital Globe, um, I don't know, maybe all those guys are the same company now, um, they have paying customers that will pay them to take data around the equator where people live. Um, but no one was really interested in buying data at the poles. Uh, good for cryosphere researchers. So. Um, what they found is that there's a lot of overlapping stereo coverage at the poles over this ice that would allow them to kind of fill in gaps in their, their kind of ice pack coverage. Uh, and they asked us, well, can you use your software to, 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 to create train models of this for us? And we said, mm, I don't know, maybe we can. So um, we, we figured out how to you know, pull in that terrestrial data, which is kind of a funny thing that we didn't know how to do that since we were so busy on other planets, but allows us to build train models of, of ice sheets and ice packs. And why that's cool, so this is an example from the Jakobshavn Glacier in Greenland. And here's the, the image, ignore the, the black parts. 
Um, this is the, the bay, and you can see icebergs floating in the bay, and, and this is the glacier coming, coming in here, and you can see the terrain model that we made. Um, what uh, researchers did, um, so this is useful for monitoring ice thicknesses, um, but also how things change. So, you know, I was talking about how it's cool when people use your tools to do things you didn't expect. One of the things that one of the researchers at the University of Washington, this guy named David Sheen, did is uh, part of the stereo process is, you know, you have your left image and your right image and you correlate them and you try and make sure, you know, this thing is that thing and that builds the parallax of your image to build the terrain model. So there's a correlator step that, that compares the images. And these are two terrain models that we made from different times. Uh, one is from uh, 2009, one is from 2011. There's some difference. This, this pool was full of melt water when it wasn't uh, a couple years ago. But what David did is he took those terrain models that we had made and ran them through our correlator again, um, which seems strange to us. We wouldn't have thought to do that. But what David wanted to do is to find out how fast the ice was moving between the two terrain models that we had made. And that resulted in this map down here that shows how the ice was moving. And of course, and it turns out that it's really hard to instrument glaciers because of the Arctic conditions and the fact that ice moves, but it moves slowly and it really chews up instruments. And so it's really actually hard to get this kind of data really in any other way. So that was pretty cool. We were pretty happy about that. So it allowed uh, these researchers to take terrain models uh, of, of glacier ice and see how they were moving. But more importantly, we're interested in how, or they're interested in how ice pack changes are happening. And again, without ice sat up, it was hard for them to monitor and measure those things. And so here are two, uh, again, kind of difference examples. So um, this first image on the left is uh, a difference in terrain models. So where you see dark blue, um, the ice has gotten thicker. Where it's white, nothing has changed. And of course, out here where there's no glacier, you wouldn't expect anything to change. That shouldn't change. Uh, and this is uh, over a winter. So between uh, September and, and, and March, this shows when it gets cold in Greenland, over winter, the ice pack thickens, the, uh, the glacier snout gets thick before it calves off into the sea ice. That's what you would kind of expect. The second image, of course, shows the other thing because it's taken over a different time frame. It's taken from the end of winter to one year later at the end of the summer. And it shows the loss of ice in the glacier and the, and the retreat. And if you can do this enough times um, and take measurements of the terrain model along that, that glacial um, trace, uh, our train models show that, you know, the ice is not only is the glacier retreating back, it's also, you know, you're losing, you're losing depth. Um, and so we are um, helping these guys uh, learn things about the ice pack, which is cool and not anything that we would have thought we would have been involved in, you know, two years ago. Um, but it's a way of, of again, providing the data to people in a way that's useful for them, right? We, we didn't do this analysis. We simply provided them with the tools to build the maps that they needed to do this analysis. Um, so ultimately, I, I, I know that I've, I've talked about a lot of things. I've, I've gone all over the solar system on you today, and I, I apologize a little bit for that, but not too much. Um, <clears throat> you know, there, there are a lot of challenges in how we uh, take data, how we present data to scientists and engineers in ways that they can meaningfully consume it and use it um, uh, to be useful for their jobs, either it's you know, landing spacecraft or, or, or doing engineering purposes or science exploration. Um, and we have lots of interesting ways to go about doing that. Uh, and one of the things that we're, we're really interested in doing is, uh, you know, we've talked with some of your guys here in GEO about Earth Engine, and we're real excited about um, getting other planetary data into Earth Engine and unleashing the powers of Earth Engine on planetary data, because other planets are like Earth too. Now, that doesn't work quite as well the other way when you say Earth is a planet too, but um, uh, Earth Engine should be able to allow us to answer questions that we can't really do right now, that planetary scientists aren't even thinking about it. You know, when I, I talked with Noel about Earth Engine and how it would work last year, he said, well, what could you do if, you know, if processing time wasn't a problem? <laughs> what could you do if you could just have all the data available? And I was like, I don't know. I've never thought about it that way, right? Um, Planetary scientists, much like kind of terrestrial geologists, kind of usually pick a spot and they say, here's my, here's my study area and it you know, is this you know, few kilometers wide and I'm gonna, I'm, gonna study this little, I'm gonna study the crap out of this little patch and really, really learn about this one spot. Um, because, partially because it's important to know something very specific about that place, but also because it's, it's hard to pull in all the data, when I mean all the data, I mean all the data, hyperspectral data and terrain data and image data, 
right? There's a ton of data about this planet, ton of it. Uh, and no one person can kind of have it all swapped into memory and, and do something sensible with it. Uh, and so I'm excited about you know, kind of unleashing Earth Engine to do that. Um, you know, also a lot of times what we do is we see something in an image and we say, wow, where have I seen that texture before or that kind of crater or that shape? I know, it, was it at a talk or was it somewhere else? Um, and so just having kind of sane ways to interrogate the data, say, here's an, you know, kind of image search for planetary data would be awesome. Um, uh, and that kind of thing. So uh, we're really looking forward to, to applying mapping concepts and, and, and planetary stuff to the Earth work that you do, um, to the Earth Engine stuff, and also using that to provide more uh, public-facing stuff. Uh, I don't know if any of you have visited uh, Moon and Google Earth lately, but it's stale, I hate to tell you. Uh, it's all the same data as there when we launched it in 2009, and we've taken data of the Moon since then. Um, Mars is a little better. We've, we've added some more stuff. Some of the rovers are moving. Um, unfortunately, we don't have Curiosity in there yet for reasons that are complicated and strange. Um, but we're working on those things. Um, and you know, the more data we can get to the public is great. And if we can provide this kind of science back channel, then scientists can find it useful too. Um, so I'll stop there with my kind of crazy random walk through, through planetary mapping and, and take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Oh, and, and I'm told there are microphones at the side of the room if you have questions so that it can get captured for posterity. So I was wondering, um, what's, what's the most surprising thing that you've learned from the Mars imagery? And the related question would be, um, what's, what's the biggest unanswered question that you, you hope to be able to answer um, with the Mars imagery in the future? Ooh. Um, that, those are really hard questions. Um, <laughs> So um, there isn't really any kind of one thing that I've seen that I've been like, wow, that is the most important crazy thing I've ever seen on Mars. Um, because uh, since it's kind of my job to look at pictures, which is awesome, I see a lot of crazy things that you wouldn't expect to see on Mars. So I've seen, we've caught avalanches in process of happening at the, at the Martian poles in springtime. Um, we can actually see dust coming down. We usually don't get to see dynamic things, so th those are pretty cool. Usually when we look at Mars, we see kind of, you know, we have to play CSI, you know. What happened here? I don't know. We weren't here when it happened. How did it happen? Um, so it's fun to see those. It's fun to see dynamic processes on Mars. It's fun to see dunes and ripples move and change. Um, it reminds us that Mars, although mostly dead, is not quite dead yet, and that there are still things happening on Mars even today. Um, uh, another fun thing that I've seen is uh, uh, boulder tracks. So when we have these really high resolution images, there are slopes where apparently sometime in the past a very large boulder detached and rolled down a slope. And I actually saw one, you can kind of see the path and you kind of, it kind of plows through the dust and you can see the rock at the very end. And we saw a couple of those and one time we saw one where it like hopped this small crater. It was really cool. You can see the path go down, you can see it go up you know, one side, and then you know you can see it land on the other. And there was no there's no trail in the middle of the little tiny crater. It was only only a meter or two across, so it must have had a lot of a lot of energy. So those were cool. Um, um, uh, as far as what would we hope to learn, um, man, kind of everything. So you know, the biggest question that we have, right, the million dollar question that we're hunting for on Mars, the most important thing that who knows if we'll ever, ever get to it is. Did life ever evolve independently on the surface of Mars, right? That would totally change everything we know about how things work, okay? Um, it turns out that's a really hard thing to get at because it's possible that we could look everywhere and still not find it even if it did happen, right? Um, so our process on Mars is to kind of follow the trails, not necessarily of, of water because although that is what we, we do is we try and you know, think about what places might water have, have been for a long enough period of time to, to make enough layers or, or to, you know, where do we think life might have started? It needs energy and it needs water, at least as far as we know. It may be different on Mars, but we have to go with what we know. Um, and so places where we monitor things on Mars, where we might find traces of that are valuable to us, right? So from above, we can't go in and say, is there a microbe there? We can't see that from where we are. But what we can do is we can say, oh, is that, you know, is there liquid moving down the slope there today? Or, you know, is that just ice or is that, um, 
you know, just dry rocks, um, and, and taking that data and understanding that data set as a whole so we can find places where, oh, was there you know, water activity here? Is there water activity somewhere today where we could send a spacecraft to do, to do more good, you know, to do more science in situ where at the, you know, the pinpoint of where we need it um, is what, we, what we're looking for from, from orbit is to kind of, kind of get the gestalt and figure out where it's worthwhile to send more, more spacecraft or more assets. That's a great question. I probably answered it very badly. Um, how long does it take to process a single stereo pair? Um, how long does it take to process? Um, it depends. How, how big are your input images? Um, so, um, um, uh, mock images, so I, I know this because he knows how big a mock image is. Uh, it's from the Mars Orbital Camera from a spacecraft a couple years ago. Um, they're a couple thousand pixels by a couple thousand pixels. Those take like five minutes to run. Um, high rise images, that are much bigger, that are 10,000 pixels or 20,000 pixels wide by kind of 40 or 50,000 pixels long. Those can take 10, 15 CPU hours. Kind of depends on what's in the scene um, and how smart our, our algorithms are, right? So if things are well behaved and it finds its matches quickly, it can go shorter. If it gets confused and finds a lot of false positives, it, it, it may take longer. Um, I don't know how long it took to, to do the, the terrestrial ones. I haven't, uh, I have to talk to Zach about that. But in, in that, that order of time. Great. Well, thank you very much. Enjoy your afternoons.